uh, they call me the state naturalist. I guess I'm the one that goes statewide and does what comes natural. And how I got to be such is an interesting story. I, I guess when I was about five, my dad took, and mom took me to Real Foot Lake and we, we went fishing and I caught my first fish out of the spillway at a little white fox terrier dog that was so excited she jumped in the water and helped bring the fish in, a little brim. And then uh, we laughed at her and that's the first time I realized dogs blush like people when you laugh at them. And uh, Dad took me to the woods. Uh, we, we moved from Darsburg, where I was born, to Memphis. And um, he, wanted, he and Mother wanted us to have better schooling. And he's, after the woods, I didn't find this out till many years later, he told Mother, he says, I'm going to take that boy to the woods. I don't want him to grow up in town and not know the difference. Because Dad had grown up in a subsistence farm uh, east of Darsburg with five brothers. And what they grew and what they, they shot and what they trapped is what they ate. And if they didn't, they did without. They, the dad had a degree in agriculture, my granddad in 1899, uh, but uh, he, he, he operated a sort of organic uh, farm over there that they lived off of, which I was too little to have known, but uh, except for some wonderful times in the kitchen of my grandmother and the wonderful smells of that country home and cooking. But uh, Dad took me to the woods and showed me the differences in the leaves and the grapevines where the squirrels had been uh, scratching and using and said, that you can see one side that's where the bark's worn off, boy, that's where the squirrels go up to the hickory nut tree. And when I got home with frogs in my pockets and, and, and fossils and lizards, Mother didn't throw them out. And that got me started. So I had so many of these little crinoid fossils, I started picking them up at a church camp. I went to at Memphis. There was a park called Shelby Forest. And when I was about 12, we had a camp out there and I got to go with my two little neighborhood buddies. And there were all these little crinoid bones and what we call Indian money. Some of them were hollow and the Indians would make beads. Anyway, I started saving those and I had several thousand and uh, took them to the um, Memphis Museum. And the director there, a nice lady named uh, um, Ruth, um, took us in to meet uh, a little guy named Kenneth Bodwin. Uh, he was too short for his feet to reach the clutch pedals, he, so he never drove. But he was a true Renaissance man. He was an amateur archaeologist, a full-time poet. Uh, he worked as a secretary for a local college. And uh, he introduced us to the world of, of nature and culture and poetry. And um, we joined the Archaeological and Geological Society and went out on their field trips. We went to Arkansas to dig quartz crystals. We went to Pickwick Dam to look for trilobites. Uh, we found on our bicycle around Memphis uh, two dozen Indian sites. And we saved the artifacts and we labeled them. And we, we eventually gave them to the uh, university there who some graduate student wrote a master's thesis off of our archaeological exploration along the lower reaches of Nonconnor Creek. When Mr. Bodwin and my sister helped me to publish that, Bodwin said, someday that'll help you win a scholarship. Well, he was right, it, because I had published in 1952. Tulane gave me a doctoral fellowship, uh, or at least that was one of the reasons I had been going to, by that time, Southwestern College at Memphis getting my degree. When I was in high school, uh, I used to go around to d different classes and uh, clubs, and sometimes even uh, University of Memphis, Memphis State at that time, and give uh, programs on rocks and geology, local archaeology and Indians. And uh, I, uh, had, I joined the Tennessee Archaeological Society and was elected vice president of that when I was 15. I, we had one other delegate from Memphis, Dr. Bonham, who was elected president. They needed a vice president, and I was there in handy. So uh, we planned the next year's meeting that was in Chattanooga. And I had met uh, a Charles Peacock uh, with that association. He had succeeded in getting our governor at that time to buy the Duck River cash back from the Missouri Historical Society, which is now at the UT Museum. So uh, I was fairly knowledgeable about that stuff to the extent that later one of the Burden Club ladies said, we thought you were a college kid, not a high school kid. So I uh, had a little fun with that. And in fact, when I was 16, I went out to Shelby Forest and gave uh, the little museum there a, a rock collection with petrified wood that we'd found nearby and uh, arrowheads and all that. And the ranger said, well, what are you doing this summer, Sonny? And I said, not much. And he said, why don't you be our summer naturalist. Oh, I couldn't believe uh, 
good luck and they were going to pay me it was two hundred dollars a month in those days um, for something I like to do and uh, over the years I've, I've it, it's given five days to my work week I haven't had to work at all I've just enjoyed taking this stuff out and showing people and um, when I was uh, leaving Messick High School and uh, going on to Southwestern at Memphis at that time now Rhodes College to major in biology and then later in anthropology um, I <clears throat> began um, with Mr. Bodwin's influence writing poetry and um, going to these lectures at the Goodman Institute and learning from the, the various scholars and, the, and the co collecting rare books. I bought my first uh, Antiquities of Tennessee for $17 in Memphis, I believe, from the Blue and Gray Bookstore, and the man let me pay it off by the summer, t uh, summer work. And I bought my Leica camera when I was 18 at a pawn shop in Memphis and spent the rest of the summer paying that off. That was the best thing I ever did because the uh, camera pictures I shot back then I'm still using and they're still sharp. So um, I wrote a little poem then called Looking Upward, Looking Downward, Looking All Around, Sensing Something, Smelling Nothing, What's There to Be Found? Well, there is something in that nothing that we will not see lest our mind is used to looking and lest our soul longs to be. And so I um, felt from those early years the inspiration of, of uh, nature and, and, and human nature that we derive from the, from the spirit. Nothing moves us like things of the spirit. And to be able to, to see that in nature and to be able to share that with other people seemed to be what I like to do. Uh, when I was 15, my dad drove me over to a park in Arkansas to the uh, Rotary Club. There was an Indian mound which had been sold to the highway department for fill dirt to build a new bridge. And our archeology span club in Memphis found out about it. And one of our members was a Mr. McPherson from Ohio Historical Society. And they had a great uh, movement in their state to save their relics starting back in the last century when out of the country museums began looting uh, the Ohio Valley for Indian relics. They started to save the Great Serpent Mound, the Chillicothe Mounds and other uh, Flint Ridge, Ohio, where the Indians quarried the airheads. So Harry came down to Memphis and saw the parking mound about to be destroyed, and he said, we've got to stop them. So a whole delegation from our club went to the other civic club. But the night that um, this club needed a speaker, no one could go but me. So my dad drove me over there, and I was scared to death. I, this was a hot August night. In those days, no air conditioning on a screened-in porch of a little cafe, and there were a bunch of gentlemen in there, old planners you might call them, and uh, I was nervous. I, was, I wrote, wrote out my notes in those days with fountain pen ink, and the sweat poured off of me and washed away my notes. My knees were knocking. I could hardly stand up, and I thought I'd blown it. But afterwards, this old guy came up, and he said, Sonny, you're right says, they're not making any more Indian mounds. He says, I own a thousand acres. I'll just give them that dirt from somewhere else. And he gave that mound to the city who gave it to the state, and it's now Park and Archaeological State Park in Arkansas. And I thought, oh boy, this is what I want to do. So that was the first success. I've had many other good lucks over the years and some bad lucks as we've lost some of these places, but it made me realize that if people know about a beautiful place, as Ansel Adams once said, chances are uh, it can be saved, and if not, chances are it won't be saved. So this is what I've been working to do for many years. I grew up in Memphis. I, I did this archaeological survey by bicycle over there when I was a teenager. I started work and worked about um, four summers uh, at the uh, Shelby Forest State Park Museum and at the Chukalisa Indian Museum. I heard on in 1955 when we hired our first park archaeologist Chuck Nash, who directed the Chukalisa Museum, and I was his uh, assistant down there part-time and part-time at the Shelby Forest Museum. We brought some Indians up from Mississippi. I'd gone down to the Indian Fair at Philadelphia in 1954 in a trailway bus and met some wonderful Choctaw 
when Chuck Nash said, we can dig the archaeology, but we need some real Indians to help us guide people through Chukalisa Museum. I said, I know where we can get the Indians. So we called those Choctaw and they came up. We got two or three families and then they brought their cousins and their extended uh, tribal friends until finally we have a settlement in West Tennessee of several hundred Choctaw now, which is good because this is they're coming back to, to some of their original area that once had our native peoples. And for a tourist to sit on a log and an Indian on the other end of the log and watch them making baskets and blow guns and, and uh, pottery and things like that, this was really living history. And so that was the secret of Chukalisa. Unfortunately, as the years went by, uh, we ran out of money. Uh, some of our park's budget up here in Nashville was used up to build uh, golf courses and things which were more costly than they imagined and so the Chukalisa Museum didn't have any budget at Teal Fuller State Park so Nash transferred to the University of Memphis. While I was a student at Southwestern we were able to get a field, <clears throat> a field school uh, for summer archaeology course at Chukalisa. We didn't have enough students at, at the uh, Southwestern College um, so we, we got students from the University of Memphis, and then when the park ran out of money, Nash simply transferred his, his position and the museum, 300 acres and a new $100,000 building, to the University of Memphis. And after 40 years now, it, it seems that there may be interest in uh, remerging that with the state park. So I've been working now for, uh, since 1964, in the um, Nashville office of the Tennessee Conservation Department, Division of State Parks. Um, actually um, worked um, as a parks naturalist from 64 to about 71, uh, then became state director of archeology span to start a new division. And after getting that going, we got a $600,000 appropriation. We bought a half a dozen of these wonderful Indian sites, including the place where the Duck River Cache was found at Link Farm. We bought Mound Bottom on the Harpeth River bone cave, red clay. Red clay was actually donated by Colonel Corn, who bought it to keep it from being developed. And we've had since a Cherokee reunion, the first time in 150 years of the Eastern and Western Band. And so one of the good things too is that when I was at Shelby Forest, I met a wonderful man named Edward J. Meeman. Meeman had been editor of the Knoxville paper, um, of the Knoxville News Sentinel, I believe, uh, in the 20s. And at that time, a woman named Ann Davis and her husband, Willis P., took a trip to Yellowstone. When they got back on those roads in those days, she said, how come we have to go out west to a park? We could have a national park in our backyard. And she wouldn't shut up. And she and her husband got Colonel Chapman with the Automobile Club involved. And they met with people in Asheville, North Carolina, who had already been advocating since 1899 to have a national forest uh, in, the, in the Smokies and in, in the in Black Mountain area. So with that effort and the support of the paper, Ed Meeman told me years later that uh, the campaign caught fire and they raised money. Uh, Mrs. Davis became a state representative and introduced the first bill for Tennessee to buy a park for the federal government and it was immediately matched by North Carolina and the Rockefellers matched that and so that Smoky Mountain Park is a present we gave ourselves. At that time Congress wouldn't grant any money for scenery because a few years before Teddy Roosevelt had set aside so many millions of acres for national forest that they were mad about it and they said well not one more cent for scenery will we give. So that's how come we had to raise the money in the, in the Smokies. And Ed Meeman then went to hit, uh, interview Hitler in uh, Germany. By that time he had moved to Memphis as editor of the Memphis Press Center for the Scripps Howard Papers. And uh, when he saw Hitler's forest preserve still intact after World War I, he came back and called a meeting uh, in Memphis at the Hotel Peabody of interested citizens and said, if Germany can have forest preserves, why can't Memphis? And so they uh, published um, uh, on the paper a possible place where such a forest could be. And they, at this meeting at the Peabody, of all the good luck, a man stuck his head in the back door who was looking for another meeting of the Memphis Lumberman's Club. It was Jim Hazard, the state forester, who was one of the great state foresters who kept 
uh, searching for tax delinquent land in the 30s, uh, which was plentiful, and buying these for st and getting these for state forests. So he built up the division of forestry. And they said, come on in, Jim, we need you more than the other club. We want to find a place for a state forest. So he sent his forester down there, and they had a wonderful report of a place north of Memphis that might do. And Meeman published that on the, on the, on the press cemetery on the front page. That afternoon, he got a call from the National Park representative who had just been told by the city fathers there was no good place for a state camp for the Civilian Conservation Corps there near Memphis until they read this article. And then he said, we'll fly over it in the TVA plane and, and get back with you. And that's how we got Shelby Forest State Park, a 12,000 acre uh, pearl beyond price on the Mississippi River. 9,000 acres of wonderful hardwood cypress bottomland and cherry bark oak and then the uplands. And they had built this little museum. The Garden Clubs of America uh, had uh, bought an exhibit of wildflowers and they had developed a wonderful uh, trail system there the, uh, at Shelby Forest. And by the, the middle 50s, the weeds had grown up, the gullies had come back, and uh, the Garden Club ladies were mad. They wanted somebody to keep the trails open and take people down the nature trail. So that's why the ranger hired me to uh, do that. And Ed Meeman came by and took me to his estate. He had a 600-acre farm and a beautiful country home. And he would read poems to me over there before a crackling fire uh, as I worked through the winter times and uh, introduced me in the National Conference on State Parks to Lawrence Rockefeller and, and some of the great people in the American planning and civic uh, comment publications. And I got to meet some of the great leaders of this uh, parks movement and to go to the Adirondacks and to uh, other uh, parks and places where you could hear goose music. I remember reading Aldo Leopold's essays and Thoreau and John Muir and uh, Meeman introduced me to the, to the, and gave me a leg up. He was probably the greatest mentor I had. And um, he wrote a column, Save Nature Everywhere. He was carried in 16 of the Scripps Howard papers all the way to the L.A. Times. And this was the uh, roots of much of my uh, conservation conscience that got planted in West Tennessee. Meeman recommended me for the job as parks naturalist in Nashville that opened up in 1964. Um, I had returned from Tulane. I'd gotten married, and my wife and I um, moved back to Memphis. Um, and uh, worked on a master's in education at the university. And then um, I got a, I saw an ad in the paper in Memphis, they were gonna have a meeting about the Youth Conservation Corps. And I went, and I was the only one unemployed, so I got the job to start a new Youth Conservation Corps at Memphis in 1962. We drove a school bus, picked up about 45 or 50 boys, some of whom were uh, poor in the projects, and some of whom were juvenile delinquents and had been in trouble with the police. After working them in a park all day, they had a different attitude. We would have a lunch, good lunch break with food provided by the local uh, mission, union mission. And then we would have an hour of counseling, talking about anything that the boys wanted to, then bring them back home that evening. They'd make 30 to 60 cents an hour if they worked. And if they didn't, they, if their peers would rate them, they wouldn't be paid anything. And the, so uh, the sort of format worked, worked wonderfully well. However, at the same time I took that job, I got the call to come to Nashville for the naturalist job, which Meeman had recommended me for. And after six months of getting that started, I came to Nashville in February 64, worked as parks naturalist, and then uh, later went, as I said, to st become state archaeologist. Uh, in 1971, we bought the Indian Mounds, and then uh, after we got that started, we staffed up the, the good archaeology people. We, could, we hired uh, a Ph.D. Um, archaeologist and later uh, another one, and I transferred back to the Division of Educational Services and became an assistant director to Mr. Jim Bailey. Uh, he was uh, for many years working as sort of a lone wolf trying to uh, keep conservation education going across the state. He had a film library, he had a uh, conservationist magazine, and I, I performed the conservation lectures and outreach programs for the division uh, for a couple of years. And then he retired and I became acting director uh, for a few months. 
and then I uh, was transferred to the uh, planning section as natural areas administrator. And uh, then I hit the ground running because here was a chance to go and add to some of the natural areas. Over the years, I have worked under the table with conservation groups to help pass conservation reform legislation, um, realizing that if, we, if uh, we didn't do that, we wouldn't get into some of these programs and save these places before it was too late. Um, I grew up in the Tennessee Conservation League. I watched how those guys worked around under the table with the legislators and got a model game law established. I saw um, Herman Bagenstoss, the first editor of our conservationist magazine. It was called the League of Tennessee Sportsmen at that time, and has since changed its name to the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. But uh, Lucius Birch was another of their stalwarts who became uh, a great mentor for me. He was uh, a lawyer from originally Nashville and then Memphis. He defended Martin Luther King uh, after that uh, terrible episode down there. But Birch was a pioneer conservationist and I believe gave money to support the Nature Conservancy and many other good causes. But these guys were the movers and shakers who got things done in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Nashville in the State Assembly and with the governor. So I, uh, in 1964, we organized the Middle Tennessee Conservancy Council to try to save Radnor Lake. The Bird Club ladies took me out there and said, Mac, this is going to be subdivided. A Mr. Oman has an option on the property. One of the world's largest contractors from Nashville had acquired the option. And so the Middle Tennessee Conservancy started uh, the efforts to save Radnor Lake. They made a lot of calls. They wrote a lot of letters. Then they realized the Savage Gulf needed to be saved. I had gone to a conference in Wisconsin and I had met Dr. Hugh Iltis, who had gone to the University of Tennessee. He had a thick Latvian accent and he said, what are you doing to save May Prairie and Savage Gulf? And well, I hadn't heard about either one at the, when I had first started in, in Wisconsin. I learned about them, came back, flew over Savage Gulf and the big trees didn't look like much from the air, but when I walked down through them, boy, it was like walking through a cathedral forest. I met with the owner, Mr. Werner, who said, I'd like to see those big trees reseed the whole plateau, but the taxes are eating me up. So if you want to save them, you better hurry. We got to do something. And so the result was the Savage Gulf Preservation League formed. And about that time, the Radnor Lake Preservation Society was formed. Our Middle Tennessee Conservancy had sort of morphed into a new coalition of dedicated people like Clark and Ann Tidwell and Mrs. Dotsie Brittingham and others who, uh, Oliver Yates, these uh, college professor from Lipscomb, these people were a, a bunch of never say nevers, including a great state senator, Douglas Henry who I found later was well-connected enough in this community with his National Life Company roots to put the heat on in raising money. And they raised $513,000 in two weeks to match state and federal money. And that's another present we gave ourselves, Radnor Lake. That was in 1973. By 74, the, the uh, Natural Areas Act had kicked in. This was signed into law by, at that time, uh, Republican Governor Winfield Dunn who also um, established the Division of Archaeology uh, in, the, in the department when I became state archaeologist. He also um, worked on the Tennessee Trails Act. Most of these were drafted by the Tennessee Citizens for Wilderness Planning. Uh, Dr. Lee and Bill Russell were two of the Oak Ridge scientists who were cutting edge environmentalists. They worked with Ed Meeman and uh, the, the TCWP was formed about 1966. And then we formed the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Association about 1968 and the Tennessee Trails Association. And those groups uh, worked with the legislators and with the public to promote field trips to these places and made folks realize the Hiawassee River was too beautiful to be dammed up. CVA was already planning to dam the Little Tennessee and was well along with that and the Duck Rivers, and these groups uh, hired lawyers. Uh, they got the Environmental Defense Fund to come in and defend uh, these rivers from these proposed dams and developments. And so that began a, a higher level. Also, the TCWP uh, introduced the first 
uh, Surface Mine Reclamation Act of about 1967. I know State Representative Bill Pope from Pikeville was the sponsor of that bill. He was also the sponsor of the Scenic Rivers Bill. So these were interesting days when conservation reforms uh, started popping in the 60s and through the middle of the 70s, and the legislature responded by funding these programs, and uh, our Department of Conservation enlarged itself. We got a federal land and water conservation fund, which Mr. Meeman had supported. The Wilderness Act kicked in. We had a hearing in the Smokies to decide if this Great Smoky Mountain Park would become a wilderness area as designated by Congress. And wilderness was defined as where people go but don't remain. So some of the chambers of commerce wanted to build a new road in the Smokies, and they opposed that. So it got to be a hot potato. That hearing was held in Gatlinburg uh, in, I believe, 64. And um, my commissioner who had hired me, Donald McSween, who was one of the great promoters of parks and preservation of our resources, as uh, expected, testified for uh, the road uh, in the morning. But as an anthropologist from Memphis, I testified in the afternoon as a private citizen that I don't think the road was a good idea. There were at least 100 people in the audience, some of which had come from New York and other states, who thought the Smokies ought to be left as wilderness. And so uh, uh, there it went. Uh, the road has not been built. There's still now hope, we believe, that that issue will be settled and the park will be managed as wilderness, which it has been for several years. Over the years, I got to meet some wonderful people like Paul Adams. When he was 17, Colonel Chapman hired him as a nature guide to take the National Park Survey Party through the Smokies. Paul um, knew the park better than anybody at that time, and he was um, able to take them across Mount LeConte, where he had found a spring up there in 1925. Um, Albert Gagnier, a pioneer naturalist and bird watcher, founder of the Tennessee Bird Club in 1915. He and Harry Imes from Knoxville were camping up there by that spring. And Harry said there ought to be a, a naturalist camp built up here. Well, Paul did that. He started a, a camp there. He established the, the base camp by the spring, and he hosted the National Park Survey crew. When they came through, they had a wonderful day. And Colonel Chapman said, Paul, the governor's going to have a little party tonight and probably offer you a drink. Be prepared. Well, Paul went by the cook shack and ate a pound of butter. Then he came to the governor's tent. The governor said, young man, we've had a great hike today. Wouldn't you care for a drink? Paul said, what have you got? And he looked around. And there was bourbon and gin. And, and Paul said, what's in the fruit jar? A pint fruit jar there, about half full. The governor said, moonshine. Paul said, that'll do. And he turned it up and drank it and wiped his sleeve and set the empty jar down. And the governor said, don't you want to chase her? And Paul said, what? And run good liquor? The governor turned to his security guard and said, these mountain boys drink early, don't they? And so uh, they went on the next night. They were staying at Elkmont. And Paul, he, um, he, t he put them out where the cars could pick them up and take them over to Elkmont, and then Paul took a shortcut. There wasn't room in the car for him. And he got over to the, to the Elkmont Hotel. Just about the time, by that time, they'd had another party, and uh, the governor lost his balance and fell over the rail, and Paul sort of fished him out of the mountain laurel bushes underneath the, the, uh, uh, the hotel there where they were staying. So uh, that's the kind of characters I would run into. I ran into Paul Fink, who was one of the first people to hike in the Smokies. He and Paul were, Adams were good friends. Paul wrote a little book called Backpacking Was the Only Way. He told about the first time he went camping, and he was sleeping on the slopes of Roan Mountain. And I've slept on the same slope. There's hardly any flat land up there for you to throw a sleeping bag. In fact, the next morning, the bottom of my bag was red from the strawberries that I had mashed as I had slid downhill during the night. Well, Paul said he got tired of sliding, so he built himself a little board where his feet could come to rest, and he would stop sliding down the mountain. But the next morning when he woke up, he said, I felt like I'd walked 10 miles during the night because my legs were so tired from pushing against that board. So this is how you, you, you learn, as Ranger Red said, from the mistakes of others. You won't live long enough to make them all yourself. And I've learned from these people over the years uh, many wonderful things about Tennessee and many stories about um, our nature and, and some of the characters that have lived here. And it's, it's 
it's been an interesting career. Um, we now have 54 state parks. We have about 70 natural areas. And that, to me, is about half of what we ought to have. Our population now in Tennessee is five pushing six million. Uh, Kentucky has half as many people, about the same size state. And they're a little further along with their future planning than we are. So we've got to get busy. Right now, we see much of Tennessee is under siege from uh, pop pollution, technocracy, and in fact, greed as uh, folks move in and uh, from other places and don't stop to think the impact. They bulldoze a driveway up a steep hill and let the mud run off into the creek. Some of these places are spring fed and some of them have, I think we have over 100 kinds of darters and about 500 kinds of mussels, freshwater clams, and that's more than any place else in the world. And so it's amazing in spite of all the dams and highways and and uh, rooftops that we've got in this state that we still have such a wonderful diversity of uh, biodiversity and if we work at it we can have our cake and eat it too we can develop our new places with green rooftops and check dams in the yards and and catch basins that will keep the water from flashing and flooding flooding is something that really got my attention when i was living in memphis in the 50s some of our soldiers came back from world war ii bought houses uh, they were building out in Nonconnor Creek. Only in the summertime they were nice, but in the in the flooding of the winter rains they were underwater. So I became involved with the Nonconnor Watershed Association when I was about 15 as their historian, and uh, met some wonderful people there. Mrs. White particularly was, and uh, one of the men there was with the Memphis Council of City Clubs. He was a local volunteer and attorney, and uh, we took samples of the creek, which was full of sewage, meant the sewage was flowing into it. Then it flowed into the Mississippi River. Our first sample we sent to Nashville to the health department, and it came back almost pure sewage um, taken in McKellar Lake. And um, we talked to the city engineer, and he said, well, dilution is the solution to pollution. And at that time, Memphis didn't have much sewage treatment. It really didn't have any. They do now, and they have a north plant and a south plant. But we made the first test on that, and made me realize that that if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And if these subdivisions are allowed to be built in the creek bottoms, as they are at Chattanooga and Memphis and other low-lying towns. Um, only disaster follows, and then it's not fair to the people who've invested their savings into a mortgage. And uh, we hear uh, folks um, having this problem all over. It happens everywhere there's, there's high rains, and our climate is changing. Sometimes we get heavier, more intense storms now than we used to. And um, we've got to be prepared in the future, I think, to anticipate. We've got to read the landscape so that uh, when we fly over these places, we can look at them and see the causes and effects that uh, are going to happen. Uh, Chattanooga is built down at the bottom of, a, of uh, the Tennessee River here where it comes off of high mountains and the Smokies and high water comes. The TVA reservoirs have held back a lot of floods. One of the things that TVA did at the very beginning was to plant millions of trees. And as the trees have grown up, that's helped to hold back the floods. Over the years, the Cumberland Mountains have provided an aquifer for 13 of our major streams that water Chattanooga and ultimately Nashville and others. As these streams flow off, it's so important that we keep a balance in the watersheds and that the watersheds are not um, uh, clear cut or strip mined or mountaintop removed because uh, this causes uh, serious problems for a long, long time. Uh, I think we're gonna see in Tennessee if we can uh, replant and reforest by best management practices and reclaim our, our mining places that we can have a beautiful state and a sustainable lifestyle. But as one little fifth grader in Duluth, Minnesota said, conservation is what you eat and what you wear and where you live. And if you don't, you won't. And I think that's uh, the ultimate answer here that we've got to look at. In my career as a naturalist over the years, I have worked uh, to give programs. I make pictures of nature, take them out to schools and churches and civic clubs, 
should take the parks to the people and show them the value of these places and show them the causes of the of and effects of what we're doing. I always like to open up with the beautiful places and then I wind up showing some of the conservation issues and problems and what you can do about them and how we can live within our means, how we can save nature everywhere, how we can leave room for wildlife as we develop our subdivisions and our farms. And um, in reaching out to these people, they've reached out to me with their concerns. And so many of my best conservation ideas have come from the constituents out in the, in the grassroots of Tennessee, where the people really know and, and where they really are on the front line. Folks that live in the Cumberlands who are getting blasted, their wells getting blasted by mining. Uh, folks that live downstream who uh, worry about being flooded. I, I today live on the banks of the Crumlin River at 187.5 mile marker. Um, I'm only about 100 feet from the water and um, it's wonderful to see the river come and go there. It's to, to sit beside a living ri river. Uh, once I read a poem that said, a living river by my door and outside my window a sycamore, a beautiful white bark of the sycamore and that's what I, where I live today, it's my yard. I have some little friends named uh, raccoons and groundhogs and, and I live on the edge of the river bank and I try to keep my lower river bank wild so it acts as a safe passage for the critters. If we can leave some corridors for wildlife like that, it can make a difference in their ability to survive as our climate and as our habitat changes and degrades. So these are the things I've learned over the years and how uh, I've gotten started as a naturalist. I'm now, uh, after being Natural Areas Administrator, I went on to be uh, Acting Director of the Educational Division and then uh, later became Environmental Coordinator, Conservation Coordinator and uh, then back as state naturalist for the Parks Division as an outreach person. Uh, in 2006 uh, session, the uh, Tennessee General Assembly um, passed a resolution sponsored by Senator Henry and Odom to designate me as state naturalist emeritus when I retire to continue to do uh, conservation work. This was a project sponsored by the Tennessee Park and Greenway Foundation. They also intend to uh, obtain a grant to record 25 of my programs and maybe digitalize 25,000 of my pictures which will then be set up as an archive that can be useful for conservation education for other people as well. Over the years I've collected a lot of books and files and piles of stuff which I still need to sort through. I'm hopeful that we can reestablish our conservation education division and our resource center and uh, re uh, establish the um, sources of conservation information for other departments and other individuals across the state that's been available through our Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. This is a, a great state that we have and in the future uh, if we work smarter together to continue the effort that we're doing I believe we're going to have uh, a great future to protect and preserve and to enjoy the, the beauty of the state and the diversity of our culture, the, the biodiversity of the aquatic and <clears throat> animal life which our wildlife agency is working to protect and preserve and the incredible numbers of rare plants and species that are found in our cedar glades and uh, on our uh, mountain tops and mountain streams and we have in this state so much um, yet to be discovered. Lately, the all taxa biological inventory in the Smokies has uh, discovered many new species uh, unknown to science, and they've also found many occurrences that no one had suspected were in the Smokies, one of the richest biodiverse areas in the world. It's an international biosphere reserve. In like manner, our Division of Parks has established an all taxa uh, survey program in many of our state parks, which is sponsored by the uh, license plate iris fund. Already this fund has uh, allowed our state parks to beautify their uh, trails and develop uh, connections um, 
with native plants and species and we're working in conjunction with our Park and Greenway Foundation to develop more connections from our parks to the surrounding communities by means of greenways and possibly even blueways. So I hope eventually our whole state will be a network of parks and green spaces and trails for people to walk and bike and that they will come right into the heart of our cities, right into our um, communities which have been over the years sort of blighted and forgotten. I'm hopeful that we can make our um, our cities uh, as beautiful as possible, that we can have more of our little um, community gardens and places for people to get out and enjoy um, growing uh, flowers and plants and vegetables and things to eat and have uh, more opportunity for people to walk and exercise close to home. Uh, in a sense, I'd like to see our whole state be a park and, and people to work together to keep it that way and to protect and preserve our resources. I think eventually uh, the conservation education uh, that we once taught in the fifth grade can be maybe restored to our schools. Already we have a project uh, sense that's working uh, through the educational department and a coordinator who's helping teachers to develop programs on wetlands and woodlands and uh, wildlife and we believe this sort of thing, once established uh, in the minds of young people, will continue us into the next millennia uh, with a bright future. And this is our hope, and I believe with all of us working together in the right spirit, uh, we can keep our Tennessee cleaner and, and, and cleaner. Thank you.